Good evening and welcome on behalf of the Australian National University to this opening dinner of the First Nations Governance Forum. And of course, I begin too by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and paying my respects to the elders of these lands past, present and emerging. I particularly want to begin by uh, welcoming the very large number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from around the country who are joining us for this event. Um, some of them a little bit delayed by planes, but they're on their way, including, of course, the wonderful Tanya Hosh, uh, who's going to guide us through the evening, uh, Professor Mick Dodson, who will be addressing us a little later on, um, the formal forum host, Stan Grant, Ken Wyatt, MP, Minister for Aged Care and Indigenous Health, member for Hasluck, Linda Burney, MP, member for Barton, uh, Nari Akit, member for Karama in the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly, uh, Senator Patrick Dodson and ALP, sorry, ANU, that's a slip, ANU Council Member Peter Yu. I very, uh, <laughs> I very warmly welcome also our wonderful cast of international guests, including uh, Dr. Fernand de Varenne, UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. Where's Fernand? Oh, right there. Um, Ms. Victoria Tali Kopuz, UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People and the First Nation representatives from New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Canada and the United States, who will all be addressing and I know inspiring us during the course of the forum. And for the home team, I particularly welcome ANU Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt, Mark Dreyfus, MP, Shadow Attorney General, the sponsors of this event, the Museum of Australian Democracy, where we're meeting tonight, from whose director, Daryl Karp, we'll also be hearing later this evening, and Accor Hotels. And the ANU staff, finally, led by the National Centre for Indigenous Studies Director, Asmi Wood, Jabal Centre Director, Anne Martin, Policy Hub Director, Sean Innes, and Marion Irvin, who worked so incredibly hard to bring us all together. So, of all the many issues that are now preoccupying Australia's policy makers, none to me is more important than completing the task of reconciliation with Indigenous Australians. A journey which took far too many decades for us to get started, but which has begun. One to which many people of great goodwill on all sides are committed, but which still has a very long way to go before any of us can regard that journey as being completed. At the national level, we have made some progress, starting, of course, with the 1967 referendum, which at least acknowledged Indigenous Australians as human and Australians, but didn't do any more than that, really, to deliver real equality. There was the 1975 Racial Discrimination Act, which at least made a start in that respect. There was the legislation of 1983 and 1984 to protect sites of cultural significance to Indigenous people. There was, with the historic Mabo case in 92, the demolition at last of that utterly indefensible notion that this land was terra nullius, which the government, of which I was a part, followed up with native title legislation, which has made and continues to make it possible to reunite Indigenous Australians with their traditional lands. The passage of that legislation through the Senate late at night, just before Christmas 1993, after 52 hours of intense debate with every clause contested by the other side, the longest time until then ever taken by any single bill in the Australian Parliament, uh, was passed with the... When that legislation was passed, with the galleries absolutely packed to the rafters, as many of you uh, here will remember because you were there to experience it, everyone cheering and stamping and whistling in a totally undignified parliamentary scene that I don't think has ever been repeated before or since. That remains, I think, the proudest and most single most exhilarating moment in my personal entire parliamentary career. And then, of course, on top of all that, there were those two great prime ministerial speeches of unprecedented gravity, majesty, impact with our leaders in each case speaking not for themselves or their party, but for their office and for the country. First, there was Prime Minister Paul Keating's Redfern speech in 1992, launching the International Year of Indigenous Peoples, which confronted, the squarely, confronted squarely the legacy of the past and the absolute need now for, as he put it, an act of recognition. Recognition, as he said, that it was we who did the dis dispossessing. We took the traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We brought the diseases, the alcohol. We committed the murders. 
We took the children from their mothers. We practiced discrimination and exclusion. It was our ignorance and prejudice, our prejudice, and our failure to imagine these things being done to us. Prime Minister Kevin Rudd took that recognition, a memorable step further forward in 2008, as I think we can all remember, in delivering as his very first act on the very first day of the newly elected parliament, a deeply moving apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples in terms which still resonate, I think, with all of us to this day. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these, our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country, for the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind we say sorry to the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters for the breaking up of communities. We say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. But while we have as a nation done all these things and done them well, on so much else at the national policy level, we continue to fail. As Peter Yu, with us tonight, put it so directly and lucidly in his reconciliation lecture at ANU earlier this year, for all the rhetoric that's been devoted to closing the socioeconomic gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, the unhappy reality is one, as he put it, of increasing imprisonment rates, appalling health outcomes, homelessness and overcrowded houses, and family and community violence. And for all the huge nationwide effort that's gone into finding a way forward on the issue of constitutional recognition and governance reforms, last year's, last year's Uluru Statement from the Heart has fallen on profoundly deaf government ears. And consensus on meaningful constitutional change, change which is not just symbolic but substantive, which does provide a positive place for Indigenous people in or alongside Australia's decision-making institutions, seems in some ways as far away as ever. Which is why, in the hope that we can create here some new momentum for change, that the Australian National University is hosting this First Nations Governance Forum to share the experiences of Indigenous people, to generate policy options for Australia, drawing on colonial settler state models elsewhere that do enable a serious participatory role, indeed a genuine leadership role for Indigenous peoples in the governance of their affairs. One of the key elements in the Uluru Statement we will no doubt be addressing and one that's always intrigued me, I have to say, since I was a member way, way back in 1983 of the Senate committee which recommended it, is to give constitutional recognition to the idea of a makarata, a negotiated reconciliatory compact between Indigenous and other Australians, either as a single overall national enterprise or on a state or more local basis, as has now happened in Victoria, but under a national framework umbrella. The fact that this has, from the outset, been slammed by the Murdoch press in particular, which is always a badge of honour, as unworkable, unacceptable in principle and counterproductive, should give us all confidence that this really is an idea whose time has come. The other key element in the Uluru Statement, which will no doubt feature very prominently in our debates this week, is the simple and modest but hugely compelling one of giving a formal voice to our First Nations people in the decision-making processes of the Australian Parliament when issues affecting Indigenous people are being debated. Not a decisive voice, not a power to block measures, not even a power to initiate measures, just a voice, but a formal voice, one that could not be easily silenced and one that would enable meaningful and respectful engagement. When I first heard that this was the direction in which the consultations leading up to the Uluru statement was going, I have to confess that I was one of those who thought that this might be too modest an aspiration, that surely we needed something more than just another talk forum. 
But one of the things one learns very quickly in working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, so I think I really did learn right from the outset of my own first engagement on land rights, legal service issues nearly 50 years ago, as Tanya has said, is that there is just enormous wisdom in the conclusions that emerge from the kind of genuine grassroots consultative processes that produced this centerpiece of the Uluru Statement. And that the rest of us really ignore or reject that wisdom at the peril of getting things quite fundamentally wrong. It was shameful of the government to dismiss the First Nations voice proposal so cavalierly, so abruptly. And I hope that the voices gathered here this week will make that very clear. All that said, I do hope that our First Nations people don't rest content with just achieving the constitutional recognition for the voice and for the Makarata Commission and establishing the Makarata Commission, as, as formidable an achievement as, of course, that would undoubtedly be in the present political environment. We all need to remember that there are still shamefully racist clauses buried away in the text of our constitution, which should and must be removed. And I've always thought, well, of course, it's not a substitute. It's not a substitute for more specific action-oriented measures like the voice, like Makarata. There really is still something to be said for adding an essentially symbolic new preamble to the Constitution. Not in itself justiciable, not having executive effect, but capturing some core Australian values and including an appropriately respectful acknowledgement of the identity and the role of our first Australians. That idea suffered, of course, a serious setback when John Howard decided to go it alone in 1999 with a catastrophically tin-eared draft which inspired or satisfied no one. Feeling the need to put my own money where my critical mouth was, at the time I, I actually drafted a text of my own which read something like this. Having come together in 1901 as a federation under the Crown, and the Commonwealth of Australia being now a sovereign democracy, our people drawn from many nations, we, the people of Australia, proud of our diversity, celebrating our unity, loving our unique and ancient land, recognising Indigenous Australians as the original occupants and custodians of our land, and believing in freedom and equality and embracing democracy and the rule of law, commit ourselves to this, our constitution. That language was actually taken up as a joint submission to the government from the ALP, the Democrats and the Greens, and it was, in fact, quite well received wider afield, although one colleague was reported as saying, who would have thought that Gareth could produce an 83-word history of Australia? He usually takes that long just to clear his throat. Uh, <coughs> but it found no favour with Mr Howard and his wordsmiths, continuing my own conspicuous record of failure, despite many efforts over the years as Attorney General and other officers to make any mark at all on the Australian Constitution. So with that personal record of failure, I don't really dare to offer any more suggestions as to how we might now proceed. But I do believe that such now is the general goodwill in the wider Australian community on Indigenous issues that I am optimistic, genuinely optimistic, that the necessary consensus is achievable, even though it's going to take time and patience and a degree of political courage to advance these proposals. What I do hope and believe is that some constructive, creative ideas on both substance and process will emerge from this forum, bringing together, as it does, so much expertise, so much experience and so much wisdom from around Australia and from around the world. Hosting this forum is something that ANU, as Australia's national university, is very proud to do. We were established immediately after the Second World War by an act of federal parliament to provide the nation with a centre for research and knowledge that will guide our national future. For more than 70 years, we've been leading the nation and often the world in public policy focused research on important international and domestic issues. We acknowledge that we have responsibility, ANU, to continue to search for truth, to uphold academic rigour, to share our findings with the world. And it's an indispensable part of that responsibility for me, for Brian Schmidt as our Vice-Chancellor, 
indispensable part of that responsibility to lead research and public policy on social issues, including inequality and discrimination. We at ANU want to be not just passive bystanders or commentators, but we want to lead the nation in reigniting the debate and designing policies which remove discrimination and forge once and for all an absolutely equal relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous Australians. We've been a long time getting there, and we've got some distance to go. But I believe this week we will take a big step forward with a fantastically productive set of deliberations for which I wish all of us the best. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the evening and have a wonderful two-day conference. Thank you.